to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for animals. This episode is one for dog lovers. And if you love dogs, you should hate dog shows, especially the biggest one in the world, known as Crufts. This show is a horror show. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pageant of basically genetic freaks. And of course, it's not the dog's fault. You know, they, they have done nothing to, be, um, to deserve this. Dogs all they care about is to be loved and to have um, to be able to do the things that come naturally um, to them. And we're denying that so that we can win some silly trophy. Um, you know, we really owe it to these dogs to, to stop the breeding of pedigrees immediately. Mimi Bekshi is the director of international programs at PETA UK. Recently, she watched Crufts on TV in Europe, not for the dogs, but to see PETA activists disrupt the show. Well, it was over in the blink of an eye. It was really fast, but um, I was r- relieved to see that it was um, that it was covered on national TV because or during the live broadcast because I knew that that was going to allow us to start this national conversation about Crufts, about pedigree dogs, and about everything that's wrong with extreme breeding. Um, so I was delighted when I, when I saw them. My conversation on the horrors of dog shows on this episode of the PETA Podcast. But first, I want to thank you for joining us as we embark on making podcast land a better place for animals. We began with a talk with PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk in episode one. If you missed it, check out the links on this podcast player or on PETA.org or wherever you listen to podcasts. Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, you'll find us. We're also in the midst of the horse racing season that starts with the prep races to the Kentucky Derby in May and the rest of the Triple Crown races in June. Listen to what PETA is doing to end animal abuse in the so-called Sport of Kings. You can check out all the episodes on iTunes. And because we are really just beginning this uh, venture, when you're on iTunes, Please rate and review. It helps spread the word that PETA has a podcast talking about the issues you care about. And now here's my conversation with Mimi Bekshi, Director of International Programs at PETA UK. A dog lover, she talks about Crufts, how PETA disrupted the show, and how it helped expose how dog shows are a celebration of canine eugenics. Here's Mimi Bekshi. people here in the u.s know about westminster in the uk they have crufts what what is crufts it's the world's largest dog show um organized by the kennel club here in the uk and it takes place over four days every year and during those four days there's competitions like agility um, and he'll work to music but then most famously on the last day there's one unlucky dog who is crowned best in show now you say this is is this the biggest in the world? This is bigger than Westminster? It is. It's the biggest uh, dog show in the world. It's essentially a beauty pageant uh, that encourages the breeding of pedigree dogs with extreme and debilitating physical features at the expense of their health. Um, and then it also causes other dogs uh, harm because it's sending the message that purebred dogs are somehow more desirable than mixed breed dogs. And that leads people to go out and buy these must have breeds, you know, the breeds that win best in show. Um, Mm. And that's at the expense of these really lovable, highly adoptable dogs who are languishing in shelters all up and down the country. And in fact, the whole world. I would think that that's almost the same kind of idea that Westminster, uh, you know, operates under, but I, I, I just, I'm curious. I mean, when you say the biggest, is it the number of days, the number of dogs? Because I'm sure there's some listeners here who are, um, I know we're all, some of us are America centric and we think we have the biggest and best, uh, the, the likes of which have, you know, have, have, have never been seen ever. I mean, I, I think that's uh, not just uh, in terms of presidents, but also dog shows. So, just tell me how large again Crofts is, really. 
Um, it takes place in um, the arena in Birmingham. It's massive, and there's dogs who are competing from all over the world. So people are traveling with their dogs from everywhere, from the United States to Australia, um, bringing their dogs over to England in order to participate in this um, big four-day event. Yeah, and so how many would you say uh, are there? I mean, just in terms of participants, and then how many are there just to watch the thing? Oh, so there's uh, tens of thousands of people in the arena. I think it's probably um, maybe about 20,000. And also thousands of dogs are um, um, participating or qualifying. And then eventually it comes down to, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how many dogs participate. Um, on the last day, the last show, the best in show, it's whittled down to seven dogs um, out of thousands who have, um, who have attempted to to, to qualify. And then, as I said, there's, there's one, there's one final winner at the end. So if you make it to the last day, mm -hmm. you've got to be a special dog. Well, this is the tragic thing about Crufts is that, um, it's the arbitrary kennel club breed standards are causing these dogs to suffer. So, um, if you look at the dogs that are qualifying and that are winning at Crufts, it's, um, for example, two years ago, a German Shepherd who won best in breed, um, his hind legs were so badly deformed, he was barely able to drag himself around the ring. And this dog won um, best in breed. And if you look, mm -hmm. for example, um, this year, the winner of, um, of best in show was a Whippet. And Whippets um, suffer from all kinds of hereditary diseases by being bred to look a certain way. So they're prone to heart disease, to Cushing's disease, to cancer, to epilepsy. I mean, the list goes on and on. So every dog that <laughs> ends up a winner at Crufts is really a genetic loser. Yeah, it's kind of the irony that, I mean, you call it, or people refer to these dog shows as beauty pageants uh, of a sort. But really, it's it's almost like this this negative parallel universe where they're not really rewarding beauty. They're rewarding a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, accepted deformity, almost a, a genetic deformity that, that everyone agrees on, on one side is beautiful, but people who, you know, you know, are just in love with dogs for them, you know, being dogs, see it as some horror. Yeah. Well, if you look at the dogs who are, um, who are qualifying at Crufts, you know, we, King Charles Spaniels, for example, these dogs are prone to have skulls that are too small for their brains, which means that they are in constant agony as their brain pushes against their skull. Um, bulldogs, for example, really popular breed, they can no longer mate naturally and they can no longer give birth naturally. And that's because of the way that we have bred them for these extreme looks. Um, it's, absolutely heartbreaking when you think about dogs and you know they don't care what papers they hold or what they look like they just want to um do things that come naturally to dogs like running around playing and um some of these breeds can't even do that if you look at pugs for example or other dogs mm -hmm. who have been bred to have these smushed in faces even breathing for them is a struggle they can't chase a ball i mean we're having we're seeing vets now who are regularly performing operations on these flat nosed dogs to open up their airways how can we possibly justify continuing breeding these animals when they're suffering so much? Now, what are the dogs again that their their brains are too big for their head? Um, the King Charles Spaniel. Oh, maybe I have part King Charles Spaniel in me. I think. I don't know. Maybe my. <laughs> is that right? I think. I think sometimes I feel my brain is too big for my head, but but that's not necessarily <laughs> good because sometimes the extra parts don't function as well. <laughs> but that's, you know, it's kind of, when you think about that, that had to be bred, right? That's a condition that had to be bred. That doesn't happen naturally. No, no, no pedigree dog uh, is, is natural. Um, all of these dogs have been bred from a really small gene pool um, and very, very small number of founding animals. And so the very notion of a pedigree dog means that there's limited genes, limited diversity, and therefore um, exaggerated illnesses. So when, when one of those dogs suffers from something, they're passing it down the line. 
Um, and the only way for that to stop is for these dogs to be to breed with other um, types of dogs, which of course is not what the Kennel Club wants, not what Crufts promotes. And so therefore these arbitrary standards um, are encouraging us to continue to breed these dogs for deformities that are causing them to suffer. And you said a magic word in, in that, uh, that little s section there. You said the word diversity. That's something you don't get when, you, when your mantra is heritage and breeding. Right. I mean, if you're not if you're just thinking about bloodlines and trying to perfect going on heritage and breeding, you miss out on all that great diversity that that will give you biologically really probably a better dog, a better uh, being. Right. Absolutely. Um, pedigree dogs are not natural. They are. We have we have created them. We have engineered them. To look at a certain way at the cost of their of their health, you know there was um the RSPCA did an or commissioned an independent scientific report which concluded that the very notion of breeding purebred dogs um, breeding for physical traits is a problem and there's no way to eliminate the problems that it causes while they're still being bred with their own breed. Um, it's it's very simple. I mean, when you think about it, of course, um, when you're breeding um by you know with family members and other family members and when you look at crufts and you see the winners it's you can see their their grandfather is also their brother their you know they, they their gene pool is so limited that of course they have these genetic problems it's it just it, it's so obvious as to why but it's sort of like the royal family though <laughs> well no comment <laughs> <laughs> no comment no well the idea though is that you know, as you were saying all that, if we applied the same standards to humans that we do to these dog shows, we wouldn't be participating and we would be a horror show, right? Absolutely. And this show is a horror show. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pageant of basically genetic freaks. And of course, it's not the dog's fault. You know, they, they have done nothing to, be, um, to deserve this. Dogs, all they care about is to be loved and to have... Um, to be able to do the things that come naturally um, to them. And we're denying that so that we can win some silly trophy. Um, you know, we really owe it to these dogs to, to stop the breeding of pedigrees immediately. And the fact is, is that we have so many animals in this country and around the world who need homes. They, there are millions of animals in shelters who desperately need homes. So the idea that we're continuing to breed other animals, A, that are being bred to suffer just because of the, the, the way that we're breeding them, um, but the fact that we're breeding animals at all while we're euthanizing animals in shelters because we don't have enough homes for them, is, it's just absolutely immoral. So here we have Crufts, this massive show. This, uh, it's famous, right? It's in England. Everyone around the world you know, comes to it. It's bigger than Westminster, bigger. We, and, and people in America, if they're listening, well, that'll resonate to them because they, they say, oh, the dog, there's only one dog show in some Americans' minds. But this is the, essentially the world's dog show. 21,000 contestants, four days. They get six finalists. And there you had, on Sunday, tease a two-and-a-half-year-old whippet, and then there was a, a, a pointer named Canix Chili. I don't know what Canix, I don't know what Canix Chili means, but that, that was its name. It was, it was Canix and Tease, and the fact that you have a, a dog, a whippet named Tease, it sounds so, you know, so, you know, kind of, well, it's teasing, right? I mean, it's a, it's a very, you, you you want to warm up to this and you root for teas and, but you didn't root for teas. Well, we're rooting for all dogs, which is why we're opposed to, to Crufts, you know? Um, and, uh, we had on Sunday during best in show, as you were describing when teas, um, was declared the winner, 
we had a couple of activists who ran into the main floor with posters that read uh, Crufts is canine eugenics. And that's because we wanted to draw attention to the fact that these dogs that are winning at Crufts are bred in these really abnormal shapes and sizes, and it's causing them all sorts of genetic problems. Um, and this is all to meet the these arbitrary standards set by the Kennel Club. You know, dogs do not care if they measure up to a judge's breed standards, but they're the ones who are the who are caused pain and suffering by being bred in order to try to meet these standards. Um, so we really need to stop it. And, and that's why we were there at Crufts to make sure that people know, that people understand that this is, that this, this is not just a beauty pageant. This is, this is dog suffering. Well, let's talk about that moment, though, because that must have been a moment. All eyes were on, on, on Tease and Canix. Tease is with his uh, owner, right, uh, who's from Edinburgh. Uh, Yvette mm-hmm. Short, they're they're all there, uh, and they're about to be announced. And where where were you guys? Where 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 were you sit, standing? <laughs> so we had a couple of activists who were um, in the audience, and it was their plan to run out right at, as Best in Show was announced. You know, this is a live broadcast, um, and then we we had um, uh, somebody else there who was filming, luckily, and. Um, I mean, I don't know if you saw it, but it, the overreaction was just absurd. This is two vegan activists holding signs, and they must have been tackled by 20 people um, mm. and, and t- taken out of there. Uh, it was, it was uh, quite eventful. Did, did they know beforehand what they were getting into, or was it a total surprise that, it, that this overreaction would happen? Uh, no, they knew. I mean, we, we, it's not the first time that we've interrupted Crufts, so uh, we, we knew that they were not going to um, take it lying down. So we didn't expect that, they, that we would have a lot of time um, with the signs being held up, but um, it was long enough for us to be able to start a national conversation. Uh, we, the next day, were invited onto national uh, TV news. It was in all of the national newspapers, online and in print. We were uh, invited to talk on dozens of national radio shows. So um, just that one or two seconds in the ring was long enough, long enough for us to be able to, um, you know, talk to people about why we believe that Crufts is a celebration of everything that's wrong with the dog breeding industry. And so... It, when the media asked you questions, were they critical? Um, the the reaction was very mixed. We had a lot of people who were really supportive of the action. Um, a lot of people who were um, surprised because they didn't necessarily understand why PETA would be um, opposing a, a dog show as dog lovers. But so that was a great opportunity for us to be able to talk to dog lovers because you know, it's dog lovers who go to Crufts. It's dog lovers who watch Crufts. So they're the people who, who we want to speak to the most to say, you know, if you love dogs, which we know that you do, then you need to stop supporting this because this is what's happening as a result of dogs being bred a certain way. And um, so it was a really important conversation to have. And, and by, by and large, the, the reaction was overwhelmingly positive. You've interrupted Crufts before. And I, I dare say you probably got similar reaction. Was it different though this time, or was it was it more? Were people are people more understanding uh, today than they have been in the past? Do you think you actually moved the ball forward? You know, this is um pedigree dogs is an issue that has been talked about a lot in the UK over the last decade or so. There was um a documentary that came out called Pedigree Dogs Exposed um, several years ago, and at that time. Um, the BBC, which used to air Crufts, cut ties, stopped airing it. Um, the RSPCA took a stand against it. Lots of the sponsors um, took a stand against it. And so um, since that time, there's been more and more education around um, the, the problems with pedigrees. So there, you know, maybe 10 years ago, it w- people w- it would have been surprised by it. But um, today, people are more in, are understanding more and more why um, this is wrong, and you know, there's a lot more people who oppose Crufts than than who support it. I mean, in general, now would you say it's like sixty forty or seventy thirty against, or do you do you think it's closer to 
you know, 55 to, you know, 45, uh, more in the middle? Or do you think there are people swinging toward being against Crufts? I think when, um, you know, Britain prides itself on being a nation of animal lovers. And I think that um, when people actually learn the truth about how pedigrees suffer, um, and that's every single pedigree, there's not a, there, you know, all of these are breeds who have been um, created by humans. These are not naturally occurring animals. And people, I mean, there's so many people in this country who have dogs and who have pedigree dogs because they didn't realize that, um, you know, Labradors, for example, are prone to bone disease and hemophilia and retinal degeneration and all these things. And they love their dogs so much. And then they have the heartbreak, they face the heartbreak of having to deal with these health issues. Um, so when people do learn about how pedigrees suffer, um, then absolutely they're opposed. So, you know, our job is to have that conversation to let people know. Um, and then, you know, as I said, a nation of animal lovers, when we know, when we have that information and we know it, we make the right choices. But it sounds like you have some really traditional, uh, elements in the, uh, in the mix backing, backing PETA on this, when you had the RSPCA, you said, and some others speaking out. I mean, that's got to be a, a massive, uh, massive blow to, to things like crops. No. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the RSPCA was tweeting along uh, during Crufts every time there was a, a new dog breed being shown, explaining the issues with that associated with that breed. Um, and uh, that's really important for an organization like the RSPCA to um, to take that stand. So we're we're really glad that they do that. Are there any specific breeds that concern you? And what is the problem with those breeds? You know, honestly, every single breed concerns me because about one in four pedigree dogs is born with a serious congenital defect. Um, anything from cataracts and allergies to things that are incredibly painful like hip dysplasia. Um, and this is just a consequence of them being um, bred through generations of inbreeding and for these distorted physical features. So there is, when we're talking about a pedigree, um, there will be a host, a list of, of issues with each breed. And so our position is we absolutely should not have any breeds. These are not these are not natural animals. These are animals that we've created and we need to stop creating them because we're 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 breeding them to be born with so many problems. But some people still love their dogs, as you know. And mm -hmm. what would you tell people like that who say, My my French bulldog or my bulldog? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't mm -hmm. my my dog with the the brain too big for his head. I love him. Mm -hmm. You know, what mm -hmm. would you tell those people? Yeah. I mean, I understand. Of course, people love their dogs. Um, but I would say if you love them, then think about what's best for them. You know, you bring up bulldogs. Well, bulldogs have been so extremely bred that they can't even give birth naturally. Where how can we, how can we say that we love them and do that to them? Um, they, if we care about dogs, then we need to run a mile from these breeders and from pet shops who are bringing more animals into the world to be born to suffer. We can, you know, if somebody's so desperate to have a bulldog, um, while there are tons of bulldogs who are in shelters who need homes, so we would say, you know, if your heart is set on a bulldog, please at least adopt. But the, the, the most important thing is to not allow another generation of dogs to be born to suffer. So um, if you love them, do what's right for them. Don't allow another generation to be born to suffer. Um, instead, have them sterilized. And then, you know, it, if you can adopt another animal, go down to your shelter and, and save a life. You know, Mimi, you're the director of international programs at PETA UK. Uh, and I, I know that people who are, who are behind the scenes and, and are part of PETA I know that there's usually one story that kind of solidified their career path or their life path that, you know, leads them to things like protesting at Crufts and protesting, you know, how, how this canine eugenics uh, must be stopped. What is the reason that you've pretty much dedicated your life to 
things like this and to, uh, to working at PETA? Um, I think I, I've always loved animals. I've always had animals. Um, we were rescuing cats from when I was a, a little girl, but, um, I hadn't really considered animal rights. I was still eating meat when I was, um, at home living with my parents. I, I had managed to sort of compartmentalize the animals that I love and that I share my home with, and then not think about the animals that were on my plate. Um, and then after I left home and I was at university I, and thinking about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, I kind of thought about, well, well what do I love? What are the, what are the things that, that I'm passionate about? And, um, animals was top of the list. And so then I started looking into careers, helping animals and that, um, opened just so many doors. It made me start thinking, you know, then I would see these things on the PETA website about, um, what happens to cows for, um, who are raised for their, um, flesh or for their milk. And, um, well, then I, it was just, you know, from then on, I knew that, um, what I had to do, I, you know, I first became a vegetarian and then vegan, um, and decided that I was going to devote my life to trying to help them. Um, they are, you know, the, the ones in society who, um, are in, the biggest need um, of our help, and um, so that was it for me. As soon as I, as soon as I started thinking about um, what's happening to animals and started learning more about what's happening to animals, then um, there was no way I was going to be able to do anything else. Yeah, is is there one animal though in particular in your life that is sort of your go to face or your go to soul or your go to animal oh that my gosh. that reminds you that hey. Uh, this is the right place for me. I got to keep doing this. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, there are, there are many, um, but one that I, that comes to mind immediately is, um, a dog called bear. The very first time I went out, um, with on a ride along with, uh, in, in Norfolk, Virginia with the cat program. Um, um, I met a dog called bear, you know, these, um, amazing cap workers, field workers go out every single day in the most impoverished areas in um, Virginia and North Carolina and deliver dog houses and change the, the um, straw in these dog houses. They bring food and toys and they try to um, get people to replace, to, first of all, to bring their dogs inside and not keep them on chains outside. But if they are still outside, then to replace those chains with them um, with uh, lighter tie outs and um, and once again, CAP, CAP is PETA's program called CAP, standing for what now? A community Animal Project. Uh, I see. And and that's PETA's project where it goes into all these uh, areas around the office, but uh, within two states, Virginia and North Carolina, and they do these incredible things. And, and you went out with them one day. Amazing. And when I first started at PETA, I'm, I'm about to celebrate my 10 year anniversary with PETA. But the first year that I started working at PETA, I came to Norfolk, I went out um, with uh, one of the girls who works at CAP and um, spent the day with her. And I met a dog called Bear. You know, the thing with these dogs, they spend their whole lives on chains in people's backyards. They I mean, it's just heartbreaking to see them. They're so happy when they see the CAP van pull up. Um, they get, you know, some time where somebody's paying attention to them and giving them treats and playing with them, maybe giving them a bath, just, you know, the most basic things that they, that they are denied. And so, um, anyway, I met this one dog called Bear who was, um, on a chain, absolutely heartbreaking, the most beautiful, friendly, lovable dog. And, um, it just broke my heart. And then I went back out with Cap four years later and Bear was still there on that chain, uh, hadn't mm. moved in four years. And I just thought about all of the things that I've done in the last four years, all the places I've been. Um, and all of that time Bear has been trapped on the end of that chain, um, day in, day out for years. So that was absolutely heartbreaking, but just made me, you know, so much more determined to do everything that I could. And I'm so relieved that Bear has that cap did manage eventually to convince um, Bear's guardian to, to relinquish him to cap. And I, I mean, I was so grateful um, that he's no longer on that chain, but 
it's that kind of um it's that kind of work that you know makes me so proud to work for PETA and um makes me determined to do everything I can to help more animals like bear. Now, tell me, what would a dog like Bear, what kind of award would he get if he were there on the pedestal at Crufts? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you know, this is the thing, is that he wouldn't be, um, because the Kennel Club and Crufts, they don't, um, they don't rate dogs like Bear. Um, he doesn't look the way that they want a dog to look. He, you know, and so um, he wouldn't. But you know, actually, Bear would be the most amazing um, family dog. I mean, he was so loving. He was so lovable. And um, and because he wasn't a pure breed, he wasn't going to have any of the problems that these pure breeds have that um, end up costing people either thousands in vet bills or that they end up relinquishing their dogs to a shelter because they don't have the money to pay for those vet bills. And, you know, there's so many reasons why um, having a pedigree is just, uh, or, you know, purchasing a pedigree dog is just a terrible idea. Not just, not just because it's bad for the dog, but because it's bad for, for your wallet, it's going to cost you and it's bad for your heart because you're going to have to watch them suffer. Um, mixed breeds don't have any of those issues. So bear wouldn't have won a prize at Crufts, but he should have won a prize. And <laughs> just to just to end this, uh, is there is there any way? I mean, I'm sure the the breeders think they're good people; they love their dogs. But is there any way to be a breeder, to breed dogs, and to have it be, and you know, and have it be humane? Is there anything humane about breeding? Honestly, there really isn't. Um, I understand that, you know, people who breed dogs might think that they love dogs, but they're not doing what's right for dogs. They're hurting dogs by breeding dogs because every time somebody buys from a breeder, then they're robbing a dog in a shelter of a chance to have a loving home. Um, how could we possibly say that there's any such thing as um, humane or responsible breeding while we're euthanizing animals in shelters because we don't have enough homes for the animals who are already here? Um, so I would just say if, you know, if somebody wants a dog, hopefully two, so that they have uh, a companion, um, then please avoid breeders. Don't go to pet shops, visit your local shelter or rescue group and, and give a, a, a happy life to a dog that's truly deserving. Mimi Beshi, uh, Director of International Programs at PETA UK. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Mimi Bekshi, Director of International Programs at PETA UK, on the world's largest dog show, Crufts, how PETA disrupted the show and ignited a conversation about the horrors of dog breeding. For more information, you can contact us at PETA.org. Once again, thank you for listening. Don't forget to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. It'll help us reach more people and let them know why it's important to speak out and take action for the animals. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. I'm Emil Guillermo.